Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us and uh, thank you for thy son Jesus Christ dying for us that we may be saved from our wretchedness. Lord, as uh, we handle this uh, important topic of uh, justification by faith, looking into history, may you accord us your own presence, that Lord, we may be uh, blessed by the presentations that we shall be having in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, once again, brothers and sisters, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to these uh, presentations. This is a series on uh, Minneapolis 1888. And uh, my prayer is that uh, the Lord will continue speaking to us as um, we go through this journey of uh, understanding what is truth. And uh, this series is only meant to bring us up to date with uh, the session of uh, Minneapolis 1888, but also looking at uh, the most important things that have to be considered at such a time that uh, we are living in, when uh, Christ is uh, doing uh, his uh, work in the heavenly sanctuary. And... Uh, in fact, we shall see that uh, the work that is going on is just about to be completed. We see every sign that have been taught, been foretold in the Bible. We see all that is happening around the world, the darkness that is uh, moving steadily, covering the whole earth as it has been predicted in the book of Isaiah. But yet it seems that we are not seeing the church get more glorious as even the darkness gets more on the face of the earth. These are the things that we shall be looking into and uh, see what is um, the Lord doing and uh, what is the state of the church, what was the message, and um, how did God want his people to be like before they could be translated? And uh, this is just an introduction part where uh, we are looking to going to look at a few things here and there, just some scattered information. And then in the next presentation, we get into the gist of the matter and introducing just everything uh, as we continue with the series. Uh, another thing I want to do is um, uh, I want to recommend some books for us to uh, read as we go through this series. And uh, uh, one of the collections that I, I like to recommend to everyone of us is the 1888 materials, a compilation of uh, the uh, the messages of that time uh, in E.G. White Estate. And then uh, I like to recommend on the sides of the pioneers, uh, I'll just like to recommend um, the book by, uh, uh, there is, um, um, Christ our righteousness first of all it is uh, Christ and his righteousness by uh, by E.J. Wagner Christ uh, and uh, his righteousness by E.J. Wagner I'll also want to recommend C.O.R. that is uh, Christ our righteousness by uh, uh, E.G. Daniels who later compiled a book in 1941 I guess um, uh, revisiting the ministerial institution, uh, the ministerial association minutes of uh, that time. And uh, outside that, I'd like to recommend also uh, Calvary at Sinai by uh, Dr. Pino. Calvary at Sinai by Dr. Pino. Uh, these are the books that you need to read and uh, just find some information on uh, 1888. I'd like also to recommend um, uh, wounded in uh, uh, his friend's house, that is by Ron Duffield, and uh, then The Return of the Latter Rain by the same author, uh, uh, Ron Duffield. Uh, with also that, I'd like to recommend uh, the book uh, uh, Behold the Man by Terry Bunch. Also, it's a, a good material. Uh, we have also The Fork in the Road by Doug um, uh, This is... Um, Douglas, um, uh, I'm kind of forgetting the, the other name, but um, Robert Douglas, uh, that is uh, Robert Douglas. 
Uh, that is a book, the, the Fork in the Road, that is something I would like to recommend. And um, uh, I believe that there are a host of uh, good uh, works outside there to look in. But uh, those are the few that uh, come into my mind that I have looked into that uh, I can recommend somebody to look into. So uh, I'd just like to start somewhere in the Bible and then uh, come to the, uh, uh, the message with divine credentials and uh, see what Christ is trying to speak to us as we enter into the gist of the matter. That is the 1888 um, messages. And uh, I believe that uh, this is a series of presentations uh, if you miss them, then uh, check out my Facebook page, check out uh, our YouTube uh, 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 page, uh, Gospel Sound as Rekindling the Reformation. You will get these messages. If you need the slides, if you need the materials, conduct me uh, via uh, the, the messenger. I'll be able to uh, provide the materials that I'm using to present so that uh, we may be able to learn together or uh, just leave a comment on YouTube or on Facebook and then uh, we shall be able to go through all this. With all those preliminaries, uh, I'd like to just go into the Bible and introduce the subject before even I go into deeply into the message of 1888, the, the, the quotes and all that stuff. I'd like us to see what that message was all about when we just go back to the Bible and read what is there before I go into these quotations. And where else can we start but in the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 12, this is the place that I would like to start. Wherefore, it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I'll punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. And so one thing that we have to understand is this, that the Lord is not going to punish the enemies before he finishes his work at or on Mount Zion. And we don't have to mistake how this work shall be done and how it shall look like after he has accomplished it. When he finishes his whole work upon Mount Zion in uh, Revelation, Revelation chapter 14, uh, this is um, what uh, we find after he has finished his whole work at um, uh, Mount uh, Zion. This is um, how it, it shall be like. And uh, I want us to see how the whole issue will end, how the whole issue will end. Um, John, at uh, the revelator beholding the work as um, uh, it was uh, going to be finished, uh, this is uh, what uh, he says in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an a hundred fourteen four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So, simply, when the Lord would have finished performing the whole work upon Mount Zion, the next thing that shall be seen is the 144 having the father's name written in their foreheads. And so this is the work that the Lord has to accomplish by the message of justification by faith. And th this was the core matter in 1888 by Wagoner and, uh, uh, and Alonzo Trevor Jones. And this is what we are looking forward to study, the work that the Lord has to accomplish in our lives. When you go to the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 62, Isaiah chapter 62, we are just looking at snippets of uh, the matter in the Bible. What will happen for the Lord to finish the work on Mount Zion and how the work shall be? In the book of Isaiah chapter 62, we read, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and salvation thereof as a lamb that burneth. Now, you, you can mistake the message of Isaiah chapter 62. Look at uh, the book of Revelation chapter 
18 verse 1 and after these things i saw an angel come down from heaven having a great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. So back in the book of Isaiah chapter 62, for Zion's sake I'll not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I'll not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamb that burneth. This message of Christ's righteousness is not going to end in uh, uh, in, uh, in a dim way, the message is going to go forth with power and parallel in the whole uh, 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 history of uh, the earth's existence. Uh, continued on, we read, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name now uh, uh, this is very interesting verse 2 that um after this work is accomplished when this work is being accomplished in the hearts of the people of god we are told that they shall be called by a new name it, you, you can start seeing the parallelism that is in the book of isaiah in the book of revelation look at revelation uh, chapter 3 uh, and this is what we read, that uh, uh, he that overcometh, I'll make a pillar, Revelation 3.12, him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I'll write upon the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. But this is only promised to the overcomer. So the work of justification by faith, the work of the last gospel is to make people overcome and so that they may not maintain their filthy name, but have a new name. And so that is why we are told in Isaiah 62 verse 2 that... Uh, uh, and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now, going back a few verses in the book of um, Isaiah chapter 60, this is what we read. Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and close darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to thy brightness of thy rising. This is the work the Lord is doing in this final atonement. So as he may not keep his peace, he may perform and accomplish his work on Mount Zion, and he may place a new name upon those who are receiving the message. So Isaiah 62, that the kings shall come to thy brightness. It is about us rising and shining. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy, thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephiziba, and thy land, Beulah, for the Lord delighted in thee, and thy land shall be married. And so we are waiting for this marriage of uh, the Lamb, which is to happen very soon. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee, and thy bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Christ is waiting with a longing manifestation of his revelation, his character to be manifested in his church, and when it uh, has been manifested, then he shall come to take or claim it as his own. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold thy peace day or night, yet that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent, and give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I'll no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for the which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and they that have brought it together shall bring it in the courts of holiness. Again, we are told, go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, 
cast up, cast up the highways, gather out the stone, lift up a standard for the people. This is exactly what the Lord is seeking amongst his people, that the standard may be lifted high, the standard may not be lowered. As the earth is covered with the darkness, the Lord is expecting the standard to be lifted among those who the Father is writing his name upon their forehead. Verse 12, it says, Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward with him and his work um, before him. And this is the work that uh, the Lord wants to perform uh, amongst us. Uh, that uh, when the uh, banner of uh, righteousness is lifted up, then the Lord will have a people who will uh, be able to represent him fully, a people who shall be able to represent him fully in this present world that he is so uh, sinful. We are in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 11, uh, yes, behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh, behold, his re reward is with him and his work before him. And so when this work is accomplished, actually the Lord will be coming with the reward in his hands. He says, behold, I come quickly and the reward is in my hand to give everyone according to his works. Yes, here you see and his work before him. And so if you go to the book of Revelation, uh, uh, we read that uh, he is coming quickly and uh, the reward is in his hands. 22, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. When you backtrack to Isaiah 62, 11, he says that uh, he's coming with salvation and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out a city, not forsaken. These have been lost, but now they have been found. They have, these have been lost, but now they have uh, been found. In the book of Isaiah chapter 40, again, just looking at this message of justification and what it has to reproduce in the lives of the people. Yes, um, the vision of, of um, uh, the vision of, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 40, it says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith God, your God, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and uh, cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, you, you see, we can be uh, not, uh, we cannot be comforted. We cannot be comforted when uh, we are still in our sins. We cannot be comforted while we are in our sins. We can only be comforted when our sins have been forgiven. And then we are being told, um, speak comfortable Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare has been accomplished. We can say that our warfare is accomplished when we are still in our, in our iniquity. In fact, the next statement says that her iniquity is pardoned. We can only be comforted when our warfare is accomplished, but our warfare can be accomplished, accomplished while our iniquity is not yet pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double of all her sins. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert highway for our God. Then every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places made plain. The Lord is saying that uh, all this shall be performed when he is accomplishing a uh, uh, his work on Mount Zion when he is accomplishing his work on uh, Mount uh, Zion. Again, uh, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
the voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, what? Behold, you are God. Now, this is a, a very uh, interesting statement that um, Isaiah says that um, bring ye the good tidings. And this good tidings is behold, you are God. What is the timing of the message of Isaiah chapter 40 of bringing the good tidings and telling the people to behold their God? If uh, you go to Christ Object Lessons, I'll revisit once again. Uh, at the end, in COL 415, uh, paragraph 5, uh, we are told uh, the timing of Isaiah chapter, um, uh, the timing of Isaiah chapter 40, uh, we are told those who wait for the bridegroom coming are to say to the people, Behold, you are God. The last race of merciful light. Light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is the revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the sun of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth, and deeds of holiness. Malachi chapter 4. Look at uh, Malachi chapter 4 before we continue with uh, Isaiah chapter 14. We are told... For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud year, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord God of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root or branch. But look at verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of, of the store. And so the Lord is promising that um, there shall arise, as the people wait upon him, they shall arise healing in his wings and he shall heal people. Heal them of what? Heal them of their iniquities. Verse 10 says, Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with, that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hole of his hands and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills balanced? Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord's or being his counselor hath taught him and uh, with whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? And we are told, Behold, the nations are as a drop of bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Uh, and so uh, we, we are seeing that um, the Lord himself will perform a work and uh, uh, Zion shall have glad tidings. The people will be directed to Jesus Christ who is... Um, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. In, in fact, as we continue on, uh, why, is, why are the people in Isaiah chapter 40 telling others, Behold your God? We are told in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, that uh, page 91 and 92, that uh, the people had lost sight of Jesus Christ and they needed to be pointed back to his divine nature who is able to dispense with the rich gifts and enable man do that which he cannot do, dispense with the rich gifts so that they may be able to have the strength to be obedient to all his commandments. This is the message that the Lord commanded that it should be given. It was the third angel's message in verity. It was justification by faith. And this had to be sounded in the whole world. Continued on in the... In the, in, in the book of Isaiah, still, I, I believe the book of Isaiah 
has a lot of wonderful things that we have to revisit and read about. Isaiah chapter 51, we read this. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock when they are him, and to the hole of the pit when they are dig. Look at Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I call him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. And what is this all affair of Abraham and Sarah? This is the message of faith. You see, when these people were in their old age, when Abraham and Sarah were in their old age and they could not reproduce, and even the pleasure of Sarah having conjugal with the husband had gone, God made it possible for these people to come together and have a child. It was not an act of flesh, but it was an act of faith. And so we are being pointed back to Abraham, our father, and Sarah, who was able to bear uh, Isaac in her old age, that look at them and how he increased them. What is it that sin has done in our lives that God can recover? If women who have passed their menopause and uh, their, uh, their, their, their appetite for these things or for conjugal uh, matters can be revived and be able to give birth to children, what is it that sin has done in our lives that the Lord cannot restore? When you read Joel chapter 1, he says that he will restore that which his great army has taken, the caterpillar, the kankawang, the great locust, the Lord promises that he shall restore to his children. And so we are told that no one has sinned so much as that he cannot be atoned for. So long as we accept the invitations of mercy, the Lord will be able to do a great work among us. Only believe and it shall be true. Uh, the Lord will supply uh, that which is needed. Uh, continue on with Isaiah chapter 51 in uh, verse 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, just what we have been uh, reading in uh, Isaiah chapter 40. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he'll comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord, joy and gladness shall be found there in thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Talking about the garden of Eden, which was fruitful and there was no sin there with the, the holy pair. This is what the Lord is seeking to restore everything unto the garden of Eden. And he has promised that he shall perform it. The word which has gone out of his mouth shall not return void. Isaiah chapter 55. Hearken unto me. My people, uh, uh, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I'll make my judgment rest for a light of thy people. My righteousness, look here, my righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The eyes shall wait upon me, and on my arm shall they trust. This is uh, what the Lord. Uh, actually is uh, promising all of us that uh, uh, he's going to perform this work and uh, he shall fail not. He who has promised to do it shall be able to accomplish it. And uh, uh, in, in the book of uh, uh, Philippians chapter 1 verses 6, he says, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of uh, Jesus Christ. And so he says, my righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people, the eyes shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax all like a garment, and they shall that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. And God will have a people who will stand for the truth and for his righteousness, whether heavens or earth faileth. He says that my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me that no righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, 
Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like gum, and the worm shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness shall be forever in my salvation from generation to generation. When uh, you look at Daniel chapter 7, when the, when, uh, the judgment shall be set, this is uh, what um, we are told that um, in uh, verse uh, 27, uh, 26 and 27, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion, the dominion of the little horn, the sin in the hearts of the people to consume and to destroy it unto the end. This is what we are reading in Isaiah, that everything that the enemy has done, they shall be consumed. Verse 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. And so... Here, the Lord says that, uh, 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 lift up thy eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax all like garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be of ever. That is the kingdom that he shall establish, both the kingdom of grace in our hearts and the kingdom of glory. When sin shall be done away, it is righteousness shall be forever my righteousness shall not be abolished. So the righteousness that the Lord will put in his people while doing the final cleansing of the sanctuary shall be forever and shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall be eaten. This uh, dominion of the evil one shall be consumed away. But... The righteousness shall be ever the salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, awake as in the ancient days in the generations of the old. Art thou not in that hath cut Rahab and wooden the dragon? You see, this Rahab is likened unto the dragon, the dragon which is the old serpent, the devil, who has given his seed to the little horn, and his dominion is going to be taken away, but the dominion of God, that is righteousness, shall last forever. Are thou not in which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that the heart made the depths of the sea away for the ransom to pass over? Look, the Lord is saying that every difficulties that shall be placed in the way of his children, he shall enable them to pass over. In fact, in uh, Isaiah chapter 43, we read that, uh, but, said the Lord, but now thus said the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee, and thou, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee and that is what we are reading that uh, at thou not in which hath dried the sea the waters of the great deep that hath made the depth of the sea away for the ransom to pass therefore the redeemed of the lord shall return and come with singing unto zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away you remember in isaiah 40 we are told that comfort ye zion comfort ye for her warfare is ended and her sin has been pardoned. Her iniquity has been pardoned away. So the sorrow and the mourning shall flee away because the Lord is willing to comfort and bring righteousness to his people. I even I am he that comforteth you. Repeating the same thing. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and the son of man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundation of the earth and has feared, feared continually every day because of the fear of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile has to that he may be loosed and that he should not die in the pit, nor his bread should fail. Now, it is interesting when he talks about the bread not failing, the bread will not only fail the bread will not only fail 
fail for those who have received the righteousness of God. So the captive, those who have been held captive by sin, shall be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit. He should not go to the grave with his sin and not resurrect, nor that his bread should fail. When 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 you read Isaiah chapter six, uh, Isaiah chapter th that three, um, and uh, starting a little bit earlier, we are told that um, uh, the sinners in Zion are afraid, fearful, hath surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire, whom among us shall dwell with the everlasting burning, burnings. Look at verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppression, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from the hearing of the blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. This is victor over sin, getting the righteousness of Christ. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of the rock. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. And this is the promises of the Lord. The captive exile shall uh, hasteneth not that he may be loosed and that he should not die in the pit nor that his bread should fail it is only the righteous who shall be provided but i am the lord thy god that divided the sea whose waves flow out the lord of hosts is his name and i have put my words in thy mouth i have covered thee in the shadow of my hand that i may plan the heavens and lay the foundation of the earth and say unto zion thou art my people interesting that when the Lord is performing this work of cleansing the sanctuary and the message of justification is bringing people uh, into the fold of God and they are obtaining everlasting righteousness, he says that this shall be called my people. When, when, when you look at the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, and uh, look at uh, when the Lord makes the covenant, how the people shall be called. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be mine, and they shall be to me a people. This is what he's saying, that, uh, and say to Zion, thou art my people. When he makes his everlasting covenant, these people shall be called his awake awake stand up O jerusalem which has drunk at the hand of the lord the cup of his fury thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out there is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of the son that she hath brought up those two things are come unto thee who shall be sorry for thee desolation and destruction the famine and the sword by whom shall i comfort thee the sons have fainted they lie at the head of all street, and as a wild bull in a net, they are full of the fear of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus said the Lord, thus said the Lord, the Lord, and thy God that pleaded the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury, thou shalt no more drink it again. But I'll put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, bow down that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that uh, went over. And so this is the promises of the Lord that uh, the enemies of the Lord shall be defeated and the children of God shall regain back that which they have lost. Continued on in the book of Isaiah chapter 52, he says, awake, awake, put on thy strength. So those which are feeble and they are ready to die, we are being told that strengthen that which is about to die. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth thou shalt no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. This is the shaking. This is the purifying of the child. This is the terrible work of uh, the fourth angel in Revelation, which is to separate the child from the wheat. Terrible is it is work, but it must happen. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Lose thyself from the hands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. 
For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourself for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime in, into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here? Now therefore, what have I here? Said the Lord, that my people is taken away from for naught. They that rule over them make them to howl. Said the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is. How beautiful upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchman shall lift up the voice, with the voice together they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Israel. And so uh, uh, in Isaiah chapter 55, the call is again made. Isaiah 55. For everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat ye come. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure masses of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that knoweth not, a nation that knew not this shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mass upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than yours. And then he said, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, maketh it bring forth a bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth, and it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I Please, and it shall prosper in the thing where unto I send out. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into the singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the far tree, instead of the briar shall come up the mighty tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. These are just the few promises that the Lord is promising in, um, in, the, in the act of clothing his children with his garments of righteousness. As he does the cleansing of the sanctuary, these are the promises, these are the things he has decreed that shall happen to those who shall stand on Mount Zion. And so... When the message of 1888 came unto the church, it was a message of comfort. It was a message that was to bring the captives back from the land where they had been sold into, the land of sin. It was an invitation that the people may receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It was to be a rare word unto them so that um, they may go forth into this world and shine. In fact, um, uh, we are told that who are those coming as uh, a terrible uh, of uh, 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 armies. And so the message that uh, was um, to be given in 1888 was a message that um, had to bow divine credentials, a message that uh, had to bear divine credentials. And uh, I want just uh, in conclusion to look at some of um, the things we read about um, this message. We are told that a message bearing divine credentials setting forth the fullness of the Godhead in Christ 
And not only that, that it was not just a message of setting forth the fullness of the Godhead in Christ, but also it was an invitation to look at his divine nature and uh, 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 receive his righteousness after escaping the corruption that is in this world. And so we are told the third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which enlightened the earth with its glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. The work that might have been done will be left undone by the rejectors of truth because of their unbelief. And this is what was the problem in 1888, unbelief. We entreat of you who oppose the light of the truth to stand out of the way of God's people. Let heaven send light shine forth upon them in clear and steady rays. God holds you to whom this light has come responsible for the use you make of it. Those who will not hear will be held responsible for the truth has been brought within their reach, but they despite their opportunities and privileges. Messages bearing the divine credentials have been sent to God's people. The glory, the majesty, the righteousness of Christ, full of goodness and truth have been presented. The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ has been set forth among us with beauty and loveliness. And we shall see why it was set forth with beauty. It was not just a mere knowledge that even Satan knows Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It was a message to impart the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ has been set forth among us with the people with beauty and loveliness to charm all whose hearts who are not closed with prejudice. We know that God has wrought among us. By the way, just let, let me make a statement here that... Uh, you know, the people in Minneapolis, 1888, were one true God believers. Yet, they rejected the message of Christ's righteousness. Think about that for a moment. These were not Trinitarians per se. Many of the people gathered there were one true God believers. But their heart were locked, were padlocked with prejudices. And so we can be here tonight and say that we are one true God believers and think that this is the message that has to finish uh, the proclamation of the third or the fourth angel's message. But I can tell you, you can proclaim that message as the people in Minneapolis 1888, but if you don't receive the righteousness that comes with it, you are as good as doing nothing. You can be termed as the devil who believes that one God and he trembles yet he doesn't have a saving faith or a saving belief. Our belief can turn into theoretical uh, uh, um, understanding of things and not a practical aspect of experiencing that message that uh, we are having. And so the people gathered in Minneapolis were one true God believers, but yet they refused this message that invited people to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We know that God has wrought among us. We have seen souls turn from sin to righteousness. We have seen faith revived in the hearts of comrade ones. Shall we be like the lepers that were cleansed who went on their way and only one returned to give glory to God? Let us rather tell of his goodness and praise God with heart, with pen, and with voice. So it was not just the setting for the fullness of Godhead in Jesus Christ, but it was an invitation to receive the faith of Jesus Christ, which will enable us to walk in righteousness. This is 1888 material, page 673, paragraph 6. Continued on, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elder Swagon and Jonas. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the afflicted Savior the sacrifice for the sins of the world. It presented justification through faith in the sexuality. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person. Why to be directed to his divine person? Why present the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ? So that they may receive his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. And so, if we say that we are going forth with the message of one true God and revealing the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ, what should go before us are the rich gifts of the merits of Christ's righteousness. 
we should not just go forth with this message as a theory, but um, as it fills the whole earth with the power of God, it is our righteousness, that is the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ, shining upon those who are standing symbolically on Mount Zion. If that is not happening, if we are going with these messages all around the world about one true God, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is not going before us, we can be sure that we are not participating in the uh, uh, three angels' messages, and we can be sure that really we are not representing the fullness of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ in uh, it is um, uh, uh, experiential uh, way, in its uh, experiential way. Again, we are told that... Uh, uh, Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits and his changeless love for the human family, all powers given into his hand that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. 1888, the message that had to be received. I want us to be clear on these messages. The divine picture of Jesus, the divine picture of Christ must be kept before the people. Think about that for a moment. He is that angel standing in the sun of heaven. He reflects no shadows, clothed in the attributes of deity, shrouded in the glories of deity, and in the likeness of the infinite God, he is to be lifted up before men. How can Christ be lifted by uh, 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 allowing him to do for us what we cannot do in our own humanity by partaking of his righteousness? When this is kept before the people, the creature merit sinks into insignificance. We shall not say that these works that I have done, they are the ones getting me uh, uh, beyond the pearly gates of uh, uh, Mount Zion. The more the eye looks upon him, the more his life, his lessons, his perfection of character are studied. The more sinful and abhorrent will sin appear. By beholding, man can but admire and become more attracted to him, more charmed and more desirous to be like Jesus until he assimilates to his image and has the mind of Christ. Like Enoch, he walks with God. His mind is full of thoughts of Jesus. He is his best friend. This is MS 24, 1888. What can be said was the problem and is the problem today. 1888 controversy, a message many did not understand how to present. In MS 24, 1888, paragraph 77, she says, I wish to meditate to pray that I might know in what manner we could work to present the subject of sin and atonement in the Bible light before the people. They were greatly needed this, they were greatly needing this kind of instruction that they might give the light to others and have the blessed privilege of being workers together with God in gathering in and bringing home the sheep of his fold. What power must we have from God that I see hearts having only a legal religion should see the better things provided for them? Christ and his righteousness. A life-giving message was needed to give life to the dry bones. Um, uh, surprisingly, many did not know how to present it. Many had a legal form of religion, and what they needed is to be pointed at the divine picture of Jesus Christ so that the creature merit may sing and they may receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Today, many are looking upon men, and many are in their legal religion. They once amongst even the one true God believers, they need to be pointed to Jesus Christ so that the creature merit may sing and they may behold the lovely image of Jesus Christ that they may receive his uh, righteousness. Brethren, shall we not all of us leave our lords there? And when we leave this meeting, may it be with the truth burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet with those who will say, you are too much excited over this matter, the matter of righteousness by faith. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. As a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law 
and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eyesal. We must draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to us. If we come in his own appointed way, or that you may go forth as the disciples did after the day of Pentecost, and then you, your testimony, will have a living ring and souls will be converted to God. 1888560.4. Can we overcome as he overcame? Last points. Why did Christ depend on his father and keep back his divinity? Christ depended in the Father all the time. Christ himself, who made the worlds, was all the time in that sinful flesh of mine and yours, which he took. He who made the worlds was there in his divine presence all the time, but never did he allow himself to appear at all or to do anything at all that was done. That was kept back, and when these temptations come upon him, he could have annihilated them all with the assertion in righteousness of his divine self. But if he had done so, it would have ruined us. To have asserted himself, to have allowed himself to appear, even in righteousness, would have ruined us because we who are only wicked never will have had anything before us then but the manifestation of self. So Christ never used his divine power. He left it. He held it back so that he may teach men selflessness to die to self. He could have destroyed us if he could have used self. And that was kept back so that also we may die to self and cling on him to get righteousness as he clung to his father to get righteousness. Set before men who are only wicked manifestation of self, even in divine righteousness, as an example to be followed. And you simply make men that much more confirmed in selfishness and the wickedness of selfishness. Even if he could have attempted to use his self, when it is righteousness, it could have confirmed men in selfishness and wickedness of selfishness. And so everything that had to do with the self of Christ, whether his divine nature, whether whichever thing that you can say Christ may have had or whatever you want to say, that was kept back so that men may be taught to keep back and allow the Father to live. Therefore, in order that we in our wicked self might be delivered from our wicked selves, the divine one, the holy one, kept under, surrendered, emptied all the manifestation of his righteous self. And that does accomplish it. He accomplished it by keeping himself back all the time and leaving everything entirely to the Father to hold him against this temptation. He was conqueror through the grace and power of the Father which came to him upon his trust and upon his emptying himself of self. General Conference Bulletin, February 25, 1895. So everything that had to do with Christ had to be kept back so that the righteousness of the Father may be manifested through him. In fact, when um, you go to the book of, uh, uh, the book of uh, John, chapter 17, John Chapter 17, he says that um, in John chapter 17, he says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So the whole issue with Christ was to manifest the, manifest the name of God and keep his righteous self out of reach so that men may also learn to keep self back and manifest the name of Jesus Christ. He set an example that had to be emulated by everyone. So it was the father's strength that he held unto and became a conqueror. And we can hold unto that. If Christ had been deceived by Satan's temptation and had exercised his miraculous power to relieve himself from difficulty, he would have broken the contract made with his father to be a probationer in behalf of the rest. Review and Herald, April 1875. He, the Christian, may die, but the life of Christ is in him, and at the resurrection of the just, he will rise to newness of life. In him, Christ was life, and his life was the light of men. It is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The word who was with God and who was God had this life, 
physical life is something which each individual receives. It is not eternal or immortal, for God the life giver takes it again. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this from life from him. I lay it down of myself, he said. In him was life original and borrowed and drive. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. While bearing human nature, now this is the very greatest point in Maranatha 302.5. While bearing human nature, he, Christ, was dependent upon the omnipotent for his life. This is the Father. In his humanity, he laid hold of the divinity of God. And this, every member of the human family has the privilege of doing. You see that uh, we can overcome as he overcame, that he held back all this that was his originally and was able to hold on the hand or depend upon the omnipotent. The omnipotent here is the father. And all in humanity, we can also hold on to the divinity of God and be conquerors as he conquered. And so those who hold, who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold, you are God, the last race of merciful light, the last message of mercy is to be given to the world, uh, is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. And so this is the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is the message of justification by faith. This is the invitation for the people to proclaim forth the, the fullness of the Godhead of Jesus Christ and point people to his divine nature. We are told that the picture of his divine nature should be placed before the people so that the creature merit may melt and people may be able to receive his righteousness. And this is the word that the Lord has promised in the book of Isaiah. And we have just started looking at the snippets of, of 1888 messages. My prayer is this, that uh, we may not have a theory of truth, but we may have that experiential truth in whatever that we are preaching so that we may be confirmed in the real message of 1888. Otherwise, the Lord bless us and uh, let us meditate as we go through these lessons and ask ourselves, why is God reviving these messages at such a time? It is because the sanctuary is being cleansed and we are not in the beginning of the time, but we are at the end of the time and man must cease beholding man and behold Jesus Christ who is ready to dispend with the rich gifts of his merits so that man may be able to be changed into the image of God and the church may be purified to the full stature and the measure of the man Jesus Christ so that Christ may come and claim it as his own. May the Lord bless us and may we continue growing in grace as we go through this um, uh, series. Otherwise, shall we pray? Kind and loving Father, thank you once again for your grace and thank you for what you're wanting to do in us. We pray that uh, you may be manifested amongst us in uh, a very uh, prominent way that uh, your righteousness may be able to cover all the earth through the children who have accepted the Son. And so take us through these uh, uh, teachings and uh, may they be experiential into our lives. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.